third generation farm in the central sands of Wisconsin. So I'll explain a little bit more about our farm so you guys can see how you can connect with our practices and what we do. So we're really sandy soil. I joked with my husband when we have a child, uh, and we will eventually now, when we want a sandbox, we'll just dig down and pull the sand up, put it in the sandbox, because that's how sandy our soils are. Um, we're 3,300 acres, all under center pivot irrigation. We do have some dry land, smaller fields that we've been either helping someone else farm or that we have in transition and didn't want to put a pivot up on it yet. So we've got um, a couple of dry land acres that we're playing around with, but it's not uh, a lot of them. We don't do a lot of small grains. We would like to, which is why I'm here to learn a little bit more from other farmers that do small grains um, and maybe convince the farm that we should get cows. Uh, and the farm said, I could get cows this year, but it, I had to choose between cows and a baby. And there was not a lot of choice <laughs> at that point. <laughs> um, we grow a lot of different crops because we're under irrigation. So we do corn and soybeans, but we also do dry edible beans, uh, vegetables, snap beans. Uh, it's for can we do canning vegetables and fresh market. And um, of the 3,300 acres, we're going to have 700 certified organic this year. We've got another 60 in transition, and we hope to be at 1,000 acres organic in the next couple of years. So we do a lot of different practices on the farm. This carries over both conventional and organic. We aren't full no-till. We're not full tillage. We um, depends on the field and the year and the crop and what we are. This picture is uh, on the screen here is what you see is one of, I don't know, there you go, I can't see the clicker very well, uh, is one of our plan B after we had the rye, we were going to roll or crimp it and then strip till into it. And it just, the rye wouldn't go to in thesis, so we mowed it. Um, this was the year we mowed and we baled half of it and then we actually left half of it on the field as a mulch. And the, the part that we mowed had a lot more weeds than the part that we left the mulch on. Um, Jeff did mention that they did some where it was sort of chopped up and it dragged behind the planter. We did have buildup on our planter, but we, we had better weed coverage than what we did. We, we do a lot of research on our farm, um, a lot of advice on starting small. We typically start 5, 10 acres. We usually try and do 10 acre size plots. Um, if we're on the edge of a field, we try and put a replication through the middle of the field. We try and do larger plot sizes so that we can get better yield data through the combines. Um, so we get at least one to two full combine heads through that plot trial in addition to hand sampling. Um, as you know, in the fall, since farmers aren't busy, we have time to hand sample. Uh, we don't. Which is why we try and make sure we have a harvester head go through so we don't hand sample. We have some sort of harvest data. Um, so we do a lot of different trials. I know we talked about earlier, they were talking about uh, the biologicals and trying some. We've had some people come to our farm for those biological trials, and you'll get 10 bushels better yield on your soybeans. And we've had it where we have 25 bushels better yield on our soybeans by using a biological. Or we've had it where people come in and say, this will work, and then we get no yield difference or lower yield, actually. Um, so there's a huge range of variety that we had when we trial our biologicals. And we also use a lot of technology. We do fly a drone, Jeff, and it does not replace our boots on the ground. It actually uh, tells us where we actually need to go. With such large acreage, when we fly the drone, it tells us we're having um, plant health issues or soil issues, and we can go to that field, tissue sample, soil sample, figure out what's wrong. Um, and then we can use it to reduce the amount we're spraying if it's on a conventional field or even organic. We can adjust our management practices to it. We don't, like I said, we don't do a lot of no-till, but we do, we've been roller crimping. Uh, this year we'll finish, I think, our fourth season, actually, of roller crimping. We've no-till planted into a winter field cover. We strip till quite a bit. Uh, I think there was a question earlier about planting into a living cover. The raw, this clover, it's a red clover. We stripped till into it, planted sunflowers, and left the field. We actually irrigated it less than the other half of the field, which was the organic uh, darker kidney beans. And it just was a very successful trial for us. It was the second year we tried it. This next year, we have another field set up into red clover that we're going to actually put into dry beans. Um, and we're going to see how strip tilling into the red clover with dry beans will work or not. So. Yep. 
Red, yeah. Yeah, Crimson Clover. Um, so it's actually been really successful for us planting to a living red clover. The second year was not as successful because we had a very cold year. Uh, the germ was really poor in our sunflowers, and the red clover did choke some of it out. But our first year, we had a mode, a mode trial and then a non-mode trial of that crimson clover, and they both were successful. So we just we learned how to how we're going to need to adjust our management based on the weather. Uh, we've done some roller crimping with the uh, soybeans. We've done this is our first year roller crimping soybeans. We did plant it early, and um, we roller crimp, crimp the soybeans at V2, V3. The reason why we figured it would work is we land roll all of our soybeans anyway um, at about V2 or V3. We find that we have a 5 to 8 bushel increase when we land roll, and we figured if we land roll it and it works, let's try roller crimping. Um, the second picture, we did get some weeds coming through, but the soybeans did finally outcompete them, so it wasn't clean looking, but it, um, I've got yield results later on how it, how it worked. We also do the interseeding with that non vernalized rye. This is our this was our third season doing it. We started at 10 acres, then we did 30, and now we did 60 acres. Um, this year we did 10 days before we spread the rye before the soybeans. It was actually three to four days before the soybeans we spread the rye, and then zero days at planting we spread the rye. So we, we wanted to see if there was a difference in the rye spreading. And the, our yield results was that our so we had some in dry land, which was really helpful. But the three days before the rye was um, better yielding than the 10 days before. We kind of theorized that the rye, it was able to establish and probably steal nutrients or water from the soybeans. And the soybeans just couldn't outcompete that rye, and it, choked it, it was more choking it out. Um, the three days before, it seemed like the soybeans could you know, get a hold and get ahead of that rye. Um, you can see that our roller crimped soy following corn was approximately the same meal as our soy with the non vernalized the, the three days before. Uh, we were pretty happy with that. Our roller crimped soy, it's actually not soy on soy, it's soy on dry beans, uh, did not as well, and it was more weedy. We don't know if that was legacy or field location. Um, we thought we had enough plots where it wasn't field location, but I'm, just, I'm not sure yet. Uh, we're going to retry everything again. We on the farm, when we do research, we try it one year, we try it the next year. Sometimes we change a little bit because you learn something, and as a farmer, you can't try the same thing three years in a row if you're learning lessons every year. We just, we don't have the time to do it. Um, so that's why we change our trials out. But we've got, um, whenever we do our trials, we try and collect those yield results. If we can't get yield results, we try and have some sort of quantitative data for our 